Please be seated. Nathan, can you turn the lights down just a hair, buddy? Thank you. Well, good morning, my brothers and sisters. It is always a joy and a pleasure to bring the Word of God before you. If you would please open up to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be examining verses 3 through 6. I think your bulletin says 4 through 6. That's my mistake. We're going to include verses 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Let's pray. Father of heaven, we pray now, O oh God, that for the sake of Christ, you would enlighten the eyes of our heart to receive the word of God with power from on high, with clarity, with conviction, Lord, we pray that you would sanctify your people today through the means of the word, by the efficacious ministry and power of the Holy Spirit. And we yet again pray for our dear Pastor Mike as he would be attending the pulpit, probably right now at his uh, home church. We pray, Lord, likewise, that you would fill him with wisdom from the scripture, unction from on high. You would give him a, an articulate tongue to speak clearly, boldly, and explicitly the word of the living. In God, that it might be a sword in his hand, driven through the hearts of both saints and sinners alike, one unto maturity, knowledge, and sanctification, and the other unto salvation. We come before you now, Lord, dependent upon you. We need you, O God. Please send your spirit and help us, we pray, through Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, a crucial theological aspect that has permeated the entire history of Christendom from the first verses of Genesis until our modern times is the free and full, infinitely authoritative doctrine of the sovereignty of God. That is, God is God. And God is ultimately for his own glory, and he works all things according to the counsel of his will, through or by Christ, for the glory of God. God is God. Yahweh is King, the Alpha and the Omega, the I Am, the Ruler, the Creator, the Architect and Author of all existence as we know it, both heaven, earth, time, space. Genesis 1-1 declares that in the beginning, God. So you see, Moses, the author of Genesis, evidently was reformed. He had a very high view of the sovereignty of God. And God, by way of special revelation, revealed that he is reigning, ruling, supreme, and inf the infinite being who is the pre-existent king and Lord of all. In the beginning, God. So you see, if you diminish the godness of God, if you belittle and minimize the fact that the very first sentence of the Bible, God establishes his sovereign authority, then really you are in danger of missing the entire core or crux of the scriptures themselves. God is declaring with supreme and everlasting authority that he is God, and you are not God. You are but creatures from the dust, breathed out by God, given life from God. From the dust you were made, 
and to the dust you shall return. Dust in the scales, a vapor that fades away, grass that rises up and withers. God is God. He is creator, and we are mere creatures. And you see from the first sentence of Genesis, God establishes his sovereign freedom to sit in the heavens and to do all that he pleases to do. He builds up. He tears down. He produces. He destroys. He chooses. He rejects. He saves. He condemns. And no one can stay his hand or question any of his marvelous deeds. The purpose for the existence of the cosmos as we know it is that for the glory of God. God creates for his own glory. He acts in time for his own glory. He redeems fallen man that they might praise the glory of his grace. And he he establishes the new heavens and the new earth wherein every living creature will glorify him forever and evermore. God is sovereign, and he principally demonstrates his sovereign authority in creation and redemption for his own glory. Now, this is where Paul begins in our text here with this great doctrine. Now, some have said these verses in Ephesians 1 is the first doxology of the New Covenant Church. We see Paul, he puts on display, he magnifies for both Jew and Gentile in Ephesus the sovereign reign and rule, the sovereign initiative of God in the redemption, adoption, and salvation of those elect individuals chosen for salvation before the world began. Of course, Paul's heart is full of, of astonishment and adoration and worship of the God of very gods, Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. Our God who is benevolent and gracious to the most undeserving, who even before the ages began had predetermined the salvation of the most deplorably rebellious, undeserving, wicked, vilest criminals ever. All for the praise of his glorious grace. Now, in light of this, Paul, with great exclamation, praises God in doxological fashion in our introductory verses. We see in verses 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, in these introductory remarks, we see Paul, he's using the language of blessing or, or blessed, which is to say that those that God is to be praised by those who are blessed. So when one declares, like Paul here, blessed be God, he's really just saying praise be to God. Praise his holy name. Praise him for his marvelous deeds. Now again, Paul in doxological fashion is immediately thrust into adoration and worship and praise to God for the insurmountable good works and abundant mercy and steadfast love that he has undeservingly lavished upon those in whom have been blessed in Christ. Now, of course, this harkens immediately to our previous declaration a few minutes ago that God is the sovereign ruler and king of all. And Paul starts with the praise and worship of God, exclaiming his good deeds, blessing God. For his marvelous and bountiful grace and blessings that have been realized in Christ. In God, out of sheer condescension, mercy, and for the praise of his glorious grace, has blessed Christians with every spiritual blessing from the heavenly places, according to our text. It's as if, Christian, when you are united to Jesus Christ in time, God bends the heavens, as it were, and then there is an outpouring of abundant spiritual blessings 
poured out upon you and installed within the Christian by the ministry and power of the Holy Spirit. So Christian, right now, you have established within you every spiritual blessing from the heavenly places. And when a saint is united to Christ, the angels rejoice, and it's as if heaven itself is opened up and you are endowed with blessing, honor, and exaltation in a form and fashion that the scripture says even the angels appear to look in to what these divine and sacred blessings have been grant bountifully granted to you, Christian, in Christ. Think about the marvelous, indescribable blessings that belong to you, my Christian friend. You get the Holy Spirit. The eyes of your heart are enlightened. You get Christ as prophet, priest, king, as your ambassador, mediator, shepherd, savior, friend, righteousness. You get peace with God eternal life and when that day comes for you christian to stand before the bar of god's judgment and justice you will be granted access into paradise only the christian is granted access into paradise now obviously that is why there is such a huge chasm between those who are still dead in sin and those who are alive in the lord jesus christ those who are cut off from these spiritual blessings and those who are filled with these spiritual blessings. Because unbelievers have no part or lot in any of these matters. They cannot comprehend what has happened to you, what you have been granted. Because these are spiritual dimensions that the carnal mind cannot and will not comprehend. The fallen man cannot comprehend the things of God because they are spiritual and they are to be spiritually discerned. So the contrast between an unbeliever and a Christian is so radical, the change is so dramatic between a lost man and a saved person, between those who were once in nature's night and those who are now in Christ, that really there should be no confusion whatsoever, whatsoever as to who the sheep are and as to who the goats are. Now, of course, we know that the goats will stick it out as imposters for a while, but they will, time will eventually weed them out. Because, my friends, those who are filled with the inconceivable supernatural blessings from God in Christ will always persevere. They will continue through life's most difficult adverse adversities. They will continue, you Christian, will continue to be sharpened and sanctified and honed in and fashioned after the likeness of Christ, and it will be all too plain who truly are children of God walking in the light. Now, think of your own conversion. Certainly, there's a, quite a difference, isn't there, between the lost man when you were lost and who you are now as a Christian, and that is because God in his grace has deposited in you every spiritual blessing from the heavenly places. You see, God equips the Christian for warfare. He hardens you for battle. He gives you the weapons of warfare. God doesn't just redeem and save a Christian and then leave them up to their own devices, does he? He doesn't just drop you off into the wilderness of this devil-ruled world. No, Christian, you know that your Father in heaven leads you like he does, did the Israelites through the desert with that pillar of smoke. He ushers you down the path of life. And of course, ultimately, the biggest spiritual blessing of all that we have been granted is Christ himself. Christ in us. Christ as our life. Christ in our dying and in our death. Christ 
in the midst of our suffering. Christ all around us. Christ wherever we go, whatever we do, we have Christ. Can you imagine life without Christ? Now I yearn that my unbelieving friend would have a crippling jealousy over the fact that I have Christ, that we have Christ. Unbeliever, you have nothing, and I have Christ. We have Christ. So, come and get him, my unbelieving friend. Reach out and grab the garments of Christ's love, his forgiveness, his peace. Come to Christ and get him in the fullness. So, the Christian certainly is endowed with every spiritual blessing. And Paul is writing to the church, certainly to bolster their faith concerning this, and to continue to magnify the mighty and magnificent work of God upon those saints in Ephesus. Now, this likewise implies that the church itself is a spiritual blessing, because you remember subsequently in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that Jesus builds and establishes his church, and then he sends good gifts to the church when he ascends on high in the form of pastors, teachers, deacons, evangelists, and other spiritually gifted individuals to continue to build up the church and to equip her for the sake of the ministry. So you see, ministers are spiritual blessings to the church. Pastors, deacons, evangelists, officers in the church who are the guardians of the church, they are ones who distribute spiritual blessings to the people of God by way of the administration and fulfillment of these very offices. And all of you, my friends, the body of believers in general, are spiritual blessings to one another. As we would exhort one another, encourage each other, rebuke one another, uplift and assist one another. Now, this is why, as Reformed Christians, we take the life of the church so serious. Because we know all too well that it's going to be very draining and very difficult to try and receive for yourself the resources that only the church can provide when she assembles corporate, corporately, particularly on the Lord's Day. Because this is the day wherein the tangible blessings from God are discharged to the people of God. Like right now, through preaching, through prayer, through fellowship through the sacraments. So you can see at every angle of life, every avenue of our Christian experience, God has graciously and for his own glory wonderfully deposited every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places unto the Christian, unto the saints of God. So Christian, are you taking full advantage of these spiritual blessings that God has bestowed upon you in his kindness and benevolence? Or are you being slothful in these things? Are you striving with the strength that God supplies to be a blessing to one another? Are you working or are you asleep spiritually? God has given you gifts and blessings so that in turn you might be producers, workers, fruit bearers, warriors, servants in the kingdom of God for the glory of God and for the benefit and spiritual health of your brothers and sisters. Now we have been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing from the heavenly places, verses 4, even as he chose us, in him before the foundations of the world that we might be holy and blameless before him. So you see, Paul carries on to exemplify how amazing God is, how unsearchable are his marvelous and bountiful blessings, how eternally glorious are his works amongst 
all the inhabitants of the earth, how blessed, holy, and altogether lovely are his statutes, his decrees, and his blessings upon the most vile, undeserving, wretched sinners, that he, out of the vilest lump of all fallen humanity, determines to save some. He determines to save some. And he bends the heavens, and he pours out blessing upon blessing, the blessing of regeneration, union with Christ, justification, righteousness, wisdom from God, and eventual glorification. All to and for the most undeserving sinner, and all to and for the glory of the name of Yahweh, of Jehovah God, the Lord of heaven and earth, all under the praise of his glorious grace in Jesus Christ. God's mercy is demonstrated in all its splendor, power, and sovereign authority by choosing before the foundations of the world a people for God's own possession, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who would proclaim the excellencies of him who called them out of darkness and have brought them into his marvelous light. God determined an eternity past to choose you, Christian, to elect you, to select you for salvation. Now, the text before us here says God chose us. So the question needs to be asked, who is the us? Well, of course, in the introduction to chapters 1, it is, of course, the faithful saints in Ephesus. It's the Ephesians. But, of course, in the broader context, this is all Christians. And one of the ways in which God gets glory for himself in the narrative of Holy Scripture, really in the grand narrative of the cosmos, the, the history of the universe, of, of time itself, is by selecting a people before the foundations of the world, adopting them to himself through Jesus Christ, sending Christ to purchase their redemption, and in time, irresistibly drawing them to the Son by the Spirit, giving them life in Christ, so that we might spend our entire lives, both now and in eternity, praising, worshiping, and glorifying God and the Lamb. Now, that's what the Bible teaches, and that is what is set before us in our verses and in the broader context of Ephesians chapter 1. God is about God and his own glory. God is about God and his own glory. And if that's offensive to you, then you don't know God. God chooses those who are to be saved. God chooses those who are going to be saved. In the beginning, God. God's initiative. God's plan of redemption through Christ. God's purpose to save those whom he has chosen to save for the sake of the glory of his great name. Salvation is of the Lord. There has been and always will be a remnant chosen by grace. God chose to create Adam and Eve. He chose Noah. He chose Abraham. He chose Israel. He chose Jacob. He chose Moses. He chose the prophets. He chose the disciples. He chose the apostles. And according to the Holy Scripture, he chose you, Christian. God is God. And he chose you for salvation. And in time, you were drawn by the Father to the Son by the calling and regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And how dare anyone say otherwise? How can anyone take their Bible seriously and negate, deny, and even despise the plain and explicit teachings of the Holy Scripture? Now, of course, the explicit manifestations and demonstrations of this eternal decree from God 
to choose a particular person for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ finds its origin in what we call the eternal covenant of redemption. Now, is that term found in the Bible? No, it's not. But it's a summation of biblical data that would give us an explanation of these things. So it's just a title given to basically a doctrinal standpoint, a summation of a variety of biblical texts that would then give us this information. The eternal covenant of redemption is wherein the Father promises to the Son a people for his own redemption and possession, a people that would be designated as God's royal priesthood, those who would become fellow heirs with Christ. Christ in the covenant of redemption put on flesh. He dwelt among us. You know all this. He lived a perfect life of righteousness under the requirements, the righteous requirements of the law. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. He died a substitutionary death, therefore propitiating the sins of God's elect. He rose on the third day, and he was then seated at the right hand of power, and then God, therefore, has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. He, he purchased and sealed the redemption, salvation, and glorification of those of whom God has predestined for salvation before the ages began. He fulfilled his covenant vows and will in time gather all of his elect from the four corners of the world who will worship him on the new heavens and on the new earth eternally. Now, Charles Hodge says this concerning this covenant of redemption. He says, the covenant of redemption was a transaction that invo involved both obligation and reward. The son entered into a sacred agreement with the father. He submitted himself to the obligations of that covenant agreement. An obligation was likewise assumed by the Father to give his Son a reward for doing the work of redemption. The Father gave to his Son in this pact he made uh, for eternity. And Hodge lists, I think, eight aspects of this covenant of redemption. He says they are this, that God would form a purified church for his Son, that the Son would re receive the Spirit without measure, that he would be ever present to support him, that he would deliver him from death and exalt him to his right hand, that he would have the Holy Spirit to send to whom he will, that all the Father gave to him would come to him and none would be lost, that multitudes would partake of his redemption and his messianic kingdom, and that he would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. So you see, my friends, in in light of this, in light of these eternal decrees and covenants, in light of God's sovereign rule and ultimate determination on all things that come to pass according to the counsel of his infinite and sovereign will, my friends, we diminish the God's authority and sovereign kingship and reign really when we put ourselves at the center of all of this based upon what I've said. When we make ourselves the center of this story. Now you see non-reformed theology, non-biblical theology often puts man at the center of all of this and then works their way up to God, but yet biblical theology starts with God and works itself way, way, way down to man. And as offensive as it might be to our modern evangelical sensibilities for me to say this, you are not that special in the grand scheme of the Holy Scripture. My friend, did you know that you are not at the center of the Bible? God working in us and us as the recipients of God's work is actually very low on the priorities in the Bible. Is that shocking? Now, don't misunderstand me. God loves his people. You are the apple of his eye. 
Now we see right in our text that he has chosen us to be holy and blameless before him. God the Son bore the wrath of God. He was stricken, smitten, and crushed for the iniquities of the elect. And of course, that is good and glorious news. But even in this great salvation, even in those great tales of forgiveness and redemption in the scripture, what really is the chief end of all of those things but the glory of God, the praise of the glory of his grace? And you do know that the Bible ends with every living creature in the sky, on the earth, under the earth, on their face, before the throne of God and the Lamb, declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. So is that man getting glory? Is man at the center of that? No, my friends, we know that's not true. We know that every living creature will bow their face before the throne of God. And you see, this is what our forefathers have always taught. This is what our Puritan forefathers always taught, believed, embraced, preached about. These grand realities. You see, this is basic biblical truth. This is basic Bible 101. Everything that I've taught thus far. And if this if, if this teaching is, is foreign to you or shocking to you, if you're a guest here today and you've just never heard any of this, well, it's not because none of this is in the Bible. It's because without sounding offensive, you've been poorly taught. You just simply don't know these things, and, and I understand that. But you see, in American Christianity, primarily that which was manufactured, we learned about this in our Sunday school recently, that which was manufactured in the Second Great Awakening, spearheaded by Charles Finney. I understand that in the broader evangelical context, we are so used to that theology that simply says God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I mean, you see how pitiful how small, how man-centered this view is. Really, man is to be boasted in, in that type of doctrine. Man is the one who is talked about. Man is the one who is emphasized. All God is is just, he's all about you. He's all for you. You are at the center of all of this. Well, let's move on then in closing here. Verses 5. In six, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. <clears throat> now, Paul is still extrapolating for us that grand eternal narrative of this electing decree, but the focus shifts slightly in the description of the purpose of election. Now, we first saw that you were chosen to be holy and blameless before God, where in our text before us, Paul's giving us a little more information here. He says that God's purpose in predetermining his people is for their adoptive sonship. Now, think of the beauty, comfort, and security there is in the reality of adoption from God himself through Jesus Christ. Now, of course, God in his condescension, he uses rather humanly terminology here in this description. Of course, it's quite easy easy for us to see the word adoption and to think of what we know of in, in human-level adoption. A child is, is put into the foster care system, he's taken from one home, transferred to another home, and then that parent person becomes their legal guardian. Now, even the, uh, the Webster definition of adoption is this, the action or fact of legally taking another's child and bringing it up as one's own. But in all of that, with that being said, I need to remind you that God's ways are higher than ours. 
that which plays out on earth in human terms and in our limited finite perspectives and comprehensions is certainly not the same limit in scope that God operates from. So when God speaks from the heavens about the glorious predetermination of salvation for the elect and that of adoption of sons through Jesus, we see, we need to know that this is a, a spiritual adoption. This is an adoption that comes from the one who has created us. This is a kind of adoption that gives us a new nature, a new name a new legal standing, a new family relationship, and even a new image, the very image of Christ. It's amazing. So, you see, earthly parents can love their adoptive children as their own, but in this spiritual adoption, God imparts to us his very spirit. The adoption is through Jesus Christ for himself, and it is, of course, through the work of Christ that this adoption becomes a reality. By his atonement, the new, we have new standing and also the transformation into the spirit of sonship we are, has been merited for us, the chosen ones. Thus, those who are adopted, they become, we become, children of God who will glorify him. So this adoption really is beyond what we can comprehend beyond the scope of what we can even fully understand god has predetermined that we would be adopted that he would be our father and that we would obtain sonship by union with jesus christ now did we determine this adoption does a child determine his own adoption did we allow god to adopt us did we choose our adoption? Was it by raising our hand and saying a prayer that we then moved the hand of God favorably towards us and he decided to adopt us? No, of course not. The undeniable fact of the scripture is that God in love predestined us. So that means that there was a destiny that was pre determine a pre-set destiny predestination god predestined us christians for adoption through jesus christ and why did he do this our text tells us according to the purpose of his will not our will his will to the praise of his glorious grace this is all about God, isn't it? God does what he does according to his will for the chief end of the praise of his glorious grace. It was God's delight in love for his glory to adopt you, Christian friend, before the foundations of the world. Now, how bizarre and radically foreign to the text of scripture really is the Arminian perspective, or I'd like to say just the broad American evangelical perspective is on all of this. Those who may be even enemies of the Reformed faith believe that God has predetermined nothing except a plan of salvation, kind of plan B. He creates man, man falls, plan B, send a savior to redeem man. That God only predetermines a plan. Now, in the minds of many Christians, really, Ephesians 1, all that I have talked about thus far is simply irrelevant. And it is butchered so much and stripped, this text is stripped of all its meaning entirely. Again, in the minds of the Arminian Christian, of the just typical evangelical Christian, there is no elect, there is no predestining of God's chosen ones for adoption, there is no definite plan of redemption of God's elect in time through Jesus Christ. Nothing of what I have said thus far or have been 
discussing really has any relevance whatsoever to the Armenian Christian. And in fact, in some cases, they absolutely despise it. And they gnash their teeth at it, at everything I've said thus far. Now, of course, there are certainly ways in which folks like this navigate through these texts. They just define all the terms. They redefine everything I've said thus far. They, take, they make total mincemeat out of the text. And they often don't even really deal with the text. They just talk about how offended they are at the, quote, Calvinistic position on all of this. They don't tell you what the text says. They just simply tell you what the text couldn't possibly mean according to that Calvinistic interpretation. They would often say that the Reformed view on something like Ephesians 1 turns God into some tyrannical, maniacal God that no one should worship. Well, I find that to be very sad. How sad and offensive that position is to hold in light of the clear testimony of Scripture, and how angry God must be at the maligning of his word and his glory being trampled underfoot. And let me tell you something in light of this. Let me tell you something to uh, my Armenian friend, or non-reformed friend. Not liking something doesn't determine whether that something is true or not. Not liking something is irrelevant to whether something is true or not. The objectivity of something isn't contingent upon subjective feelings on the matter. God's word says what it says. God's eternal purposes stand forever, and I have never heard one single good refutation against anything that I've declared before you, any argument at all, and I've heard every single one of them over and over again. The fact is plain, Christian, that God does all that he pleases. He does all that he pleases according to the counsel of his will. And God, as the architect of the universe, can act how he wants to act and do what he wants to do. And who can stay his hand? And who can say to him, what have you done? Can that which is molded say back to the molder, why have you made me this way? Who are you, O oh man, to speak back to God? You remember that in Romans 9 that Pastor Dan read? If God wants to save some and not others, if God wants to create vessels that are prepared beforehand for destruction and in love wants to marvelously save those in whom he has determined to save, well, then he can do it, and he does it, and he will do it. It's just that we think of sin far too small. We think of God far too small. We think of ourselves as really big in this whole equation. And some would even rather say, if I were God, I would do it this way, or I wouldn't do it this way, other than humbling themselves before the feet of their creator and putting their hand over their mouth and acting like the prophet Isaiah when he said, for the Lord Almighty has purposed, who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Now, finally, in closing, we see more of the purpose of God unraveled in his predestining of his chosen unto adoption through Christ. And what is made clear is that God's delight in this act of free uh, grace lavished upon believers is really to prompt us, it's to prompt us to praise him, to honor him, to worship him. To find our satisfaction and fulfillment in him. These texts aren't meant to cause you to, to, to uh, despise anything at all, but rather to fill you with praise and honor and adoration at God. 
And you see, this really is the essence of who we are and what we do as Christians, right? We are, we are worshipers of God. And there is not a moment that goes by in the Christian life that we shouldn't find every reason to glorify God, to honor his great name. Everything in our life is all of grace from the root to the fruit. We are nothing. Christian, you are nothing but sheer recipients and beneficiaries of God's undeserving, boundless, indescribable mercy and grace that has been lavished upon you, that has been basked upon you in Christ. Why? For the glory of God. For God's own glory. He has elected vessels of mercy that will praise his great name, that might have pra the praises of God in their mouth every single day. Because in time, under the federal headship of Adam, as Adam as the head of the human race and his sin imputed to you, he took the most he took from the most vile, wretched, hellbound vermin. And he transferred them into Christ. He washed them in the blood of Christ. He imputed the very righteousness of Christ to them. And he gave them, that is you, everything pertaining to life and godliness. And he promises to never leave you or forsake you. And he will one day grant you full and free access to paradise. He will usher his people. You will fly through the judgment, Christian friend, and be ushered into paradise where God will wipe away every tear. There will be no mourning. Mourning will be turned into laughter, and you will worship and venerate the excellencies of God in Christ forever and evermore. You see, that's what these texts are supposed to do for you, is to fill you with joy indescribable in that way. Not for you to combat these plain texts. So you see, Paul is declaring again that all of this, all of this, all of these great and precious gifts of love that has been assigned to you since before the cosmos even existed. God set his affections upon his elect and due time would rescue all of them from sin and hell through the substitutionary sacrifice of God the Son. Why? Again, why is this? All of this is for to the chief end that God would get all the glory. All for the glory of God. Now, you might ask the question, maybe some of you are thinking, you know, Dan, you didn't really defend any of this stuff. You didn't go through Ephesians 1 and defend the doctrine of election, uh, defend predestination. You didn't bring any kind of solid arguments for it per se. And you didn't bring all of the different counter arguments that are used to come against our, our text or our perspective as Reformed Christians. Dan, you just, you just assumed it and explained it. And that's right. That's right, I did. Because there is a time for apologetics. There is a time to defend these doctrines. And there is a time to preach these doctrines for the praise and glory of God's marvelous grace. So the teaching of God's eternal decree in the election of a particular people for God's own glory and honor is so clear, explicit, and plain in the scripture that I believe it hardly needs defending at all. And may we cherish in our hearts the plain and clear purposes of God for us in his electing love towards you, Christian, towards the precious and beloved church. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. Amen.